Okay, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to day three and our final day of our uh, introduction to trout fishing Friday evening webinar series. Uh, I'm Dan Dow and I'll again be your host and moderator tonight. Uh, on behalf of Trout Unlimited and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, I just want to thank you again for being here with us tonight. So a quick recap before we get rolling uh, to kind of discuss what we've covered so far in our presentations. Uh, day one, we learned all about our gear needed to catch trout. Uh, last week, our presenters shared with us some information about the habits of trout and how to target them. And today, we're going to dive into some specifics of uh, trout in Colorado. So I have a really great presentation lined up for you tonight featuring two leaders uh, in both trout knowledge and trout conservation in the state of Colorado. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to give you some good nuggets to take uh, with you out into the field and help you get on some fish. Again, before we start, I, I just want to remind everyone that the Fish for Free Days in Colorado are next weekend, uh, June 5th and 6th, I believe. Uh, so the Fish for Free Days allow anyone uh, to legally fish Colorado waterways without a fishing license. Uh, it's all other fishing regulations apply, but uh, these days are really great for getting out and getting the family fishing or experiencing the sport for the first time without a huge commitment. So that said, let's hop into our agenda for the day today. So today we're gonna to speak on trout species and some of the trout waters of Colorado, your regional opportunities and some of those trout hotspots to, to look for. Uh, we'll dig into some trout conservation in Colorado. And then we'll do some kind of panel questions and open Q&A with our uh, two presenters today. So those two presenters that we have today are uh, Andre Egli, uh, the Angler Education Coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and also Mr. Ben Bloodworth, the Northwest Regional Vice President for Colorado Trout Unlimited. And I think we're going to kick things off with Andre, and Andre is going to cover uh, trout fishing in Colorado. So I will be quiet now and I'll let Andre take it away. Hey, thanks, Dan. So good evening, everybody. Uh, like Dan said, my name is Andre Egley. I'm the statewide angler education coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, if, you've, if you're new to fishing in general uh, in Colorado, you might never have heard of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Hopefully you have, but if you haven't, uh, we are the conservation agency for the state of Colorado. Uh, we work under the Department of Natural Resources and we sell all the licenses, the fishing licenses, as well as hunting licenses that you'll need in order to hunt and fish in the state. Uh, we also produce these brochures. Sorry, I'm all blurry. Maybe you can see it back here. Um, but we have brochures for every type of thing you can hunt in Colorado as well as fishing brochures. Um, so if you're gonna fish in Colorado, like Dan said, even over that free weekend, all the rules and regulations still apply. Your possession limits, your daily bag limits, uh, all those still apply. So make sure you have one of those uh, fishing brochures because the first 10 pages of it are like, basic rules and the last 30 pages are very specific rules for each body of water. So we have a lot of different regulations depending on the body of water you're on. So make sure you check that out so that you know what you're doing and you don't get in any trouble. Uh, so um, that's what Colorado Parks and Wildlife is. Uh, we do conservation work, uh, fish stocking. We also monitor, make sure everybody's following the rules and regulations. And we, uh, we have wildlife officers all over the state that are checking to make sure everybody's following the rules and protecting the wildlife as best we can in the state. Um, so let's dive into fishing for trout in Colorado. Um, so go ahead, Dan, there we go. So uh, in Colorado, we have a whole bunch of different types of trout, uh, but we only have three native species. Uh, everything else was introduced to the state. Uh, the three native species are the greenback cutthroat trout, the Colorado River cutthroat trout, and the Rio Grande cutthroat trout. Uh, there used to be a fourth, the yellowfin cutthroat trout, but that is now extinct, uh, went extinct around the turn of the 19th century. Um, so it was a very rare species found on just a couple of lakes and accidentally rainbow trout got introduced to those lakes and just outcompeted the yellowfin and now it is no more. Um, so we still have those three native trout. Uh, Non-natives are the ones you've probably heard a little bit more about in, in this series, rainbow trout brown trout, brook trout, uh, we have lake trout, uh, we have golden trout, snake river cutthroat. Uh, we have some other ones, we have grayling. It's not really a trout, uh, but it's one of those 
a fish that you tend to catch while you're trying to catch trout because uh, they live in kind of the same ecosystems. Uh, we have kokanee salmon, which is landlocked uh, sockeye salmon, Arctic char, uh, mountain whitefish, which is a cool little fish, uh, also a native, but not really a trout. So I did put it on the native list. Um, and you'll find a couple of hybrids here and there. You might find a splake, uh, which is a brook trout and a lake trout mix, or a tiger trout, which is a brown trout and a brook trout mix. Uh, but those are the kind of trout you're gonna find in Colorado. Uh, and these are the historic ranges of those native trout. So the green there, that is the greenback cutthroat trout. Uh, the orange in the southern south central's part, that is the Rio Grande cutthroat. And then all that blue, that is the Colorado River cutthroat. So that's, that's where they live. Those are their na native uh, drainages where you're going to find them. And that little yellow circle, that's where that yellow fin was before it went extinct. So types of uh, bodies of water you're going to find in Colorado. Um, for trout fishing, most people are going to end up on a river or stream. Um, and Colorado is a, a, weird, <laughs> a weird little geographic anomaly. Uh, there's only two states in the United States where all the water flows out of them. One of them is Hawaii, because it all flows into the ocean. And the other one is Colorado. No water flows into Colorado. All the water flows out. Uh, because of that, we have a lot of dams, a lot of reservoirs to try to trap some of that water for the people who live here to use. Um, so you're gonna find a lot more tailwaters in Colorado uh, as opposed to freestones, uh, which you might have a little bit more of a, uh, if you went to the Pennsylvania part of this, uh, you're gonna find more of those freestones uh, outside of Colorado. Colorado is gonna be a lot of tailwaters because we have so many reservoirs. Um, we have about 90,000 miles of streams and rivers that you can fish uh, and 43% of their, our state is uh, public land. Uh, so you can fish on those rivers. It's public. Uh, almost half the state is public land. So that's a great, great thing. So lots of public access. Um, just a quick rule of thumb as far as public versus private. Uh, best rule of thumb is in Colorado, you can't own the water. Um, you can own water rights, but if you, water flows through your property, you don't own that water. You own the land. So if somebody floats through private property in a boat, perfectly legal. If you step out of that onto the bed, that bottom of the river, you are trespassing. So uh, always good if you're on a float trip, you can go pretty much anywhere. It allows you access to some of those waters that might not always be uh, available to the public. Uh, but if you're going to wade fish, make sure that you're in public space uh, because you would be trespassing if you wandered into private land there. Right. And we also have, of course, lakes and ponds. We have about uh, 270,000 acres of lakes and ponds. Uh, most of our lakes and ponds are going to be high alt altitude ponds and lakes uh, fed by snow melt. Um, just kind of the way erosion happened. We have a lot of these little hole holes and gullies that collect that water. You get a lot of those nice mountain uh, lakes and ponds, which are absolutely perfect habitat for trout. So uh, since this is backcountry hunters and anglers, plus Trout Unlimited. If you're here, you might be into that backpacking, getting into the uh, backwoods away from everybody. We have tons and tons of opportunities for that. Trails that lead to some really, really great trout fishing. Um, you just have to put in a little bit more effort, but putting in a little more effort will get you to places where they, the fish don't see a lot of lures and flies, much easier to catch, and you're gonna be away from the crowd. So great places to go are up in the mountains for ponds and lakes. And of course, like I said, we have a lot of reservoirs because all the water flows out of Colorado. So uh, tons and tons of reservoirs. The reservoirs tend to be the biggest bodies of water in the state. They tend to be the deepest. Um, so if you find a reservoir in the mountains on the west slope, odds are it's probably gonna be nice, big, deep, hold a lot of uh, lake trout, good cold water for those uh, rainbows and brown trout to hold in as well. And those bigger waters can grow bigger fish. So you tend to see really, really big fish coming out of our reservoirs all over the state. Um, and uh, most of those bodies of waters are gonna be close to population centers. Uh, if any of you have a boat, uh, the reservoirs are a great place to go, trolling for trout, things like that. Uh, if you don't have a boat, you can fish them from the shore. It's gonna be a little bit trickier uh, if, when the water temperature gets high to catch them from the shore, but just something to be aware of. So, Places to go, uh, I always have to start with gold medal waters. So gold medal waters are 
uh, if you can, you can switch over to what they, they actually are. So this is the, the technical term for gold metal waters. It's a body of water uh, that produces a minimum of 60 pounds of fish or, and at least 20 trout that are 40, or sorry, 14 inches or longer per acre. And that's on a sustained basis, so year after year. So these are bodies of water with a very healthy fish population and also really big trout. Um, and for rivers, that has to be at least two miles in length that have that sustained basis uh, to be a gold medal water. And for a lake or a reservoir, it has to be at least 50 acres in total. Uh, so we have quite a few gold medal waters in Colorado. Uh, here they all are listed out, uh, the Nemus River, Ar River, Arkansas, Blue, Colorado, Frying Pan, Gore Creek, Gunnison, North Platte, Rio Grande, Roaring Fork, and the South Platte River. So those are our rivers. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, region by region. And when I go through the regions, you'll see those gold metal waters will be in gold. Uh, so you know where those are specifically in the state. And we also have three uh, lakes that are also gold metal waters. Uh, Spiny Mountain Reservoir is probably the best known out of those. Uh, Steamboat Lake is also a state park, part of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife System. Uh, great place to go, beautiful country and big trout in that lake. So these are where they all are, those gold metal waters. Uh, probably the, mo the best one, I, we've been trying to keep it a secret for a long time, but the secret's out. The Arkansas River is amazing. It flows pretty much from Leadville, which is almost dead center in the middle of the state, all the way down to uh, Canyon City, which is just outside Pueblo. Uh, it's almost a hundred miles of continuous gold metal water. It flows through beautiful areas, uh, through the collegiate peaks. It's amazing to fish that water uh, and really, really big fish. Uh, another gold metal water that uh, I always tell people about is Gore Creek. Fishing Gore Creek's a little odd because it flows right through Vail and, and it's a ski resort town. So it flows right through the middle of all these uh, big uh, hotels and things like that. But uh, it's one of the few places in Colorado where you can get a Grand Slam on a gold medal water. And a Grand Slam is catching four different species of trout in one body of water. Uh, so at the Gore Creek you can get rainbow trout, brown trout, cutthroat trout, and brook trout. And it's gold medal water. So not only can you get all four of those species, but they're actually pretty nice big trout. Uh, so that's a cool place to go. So I can't talk about everywhere you can go. Uh, I just threw this map in there to let you know that there's a lot of places to go. Every one of these pins is a place where you can catch a rainbow trout in Colorado. So lots and lots and lots of places to go. I can't talk about all of them. So I'm just gonna try to hit uh, probably the most popular ones or the ones that I think are really, really cool. Um, so I'm gonna go uh, region by region and we do our regions by drainages. Uh, so I'm going to start in the southeast, which is the Arkansas River drainage, and it's kind of circled or highlighted there in red. So if you live in that area, uh, Pueblo, uh, Canyon City, Colorado Springs, uh, all the way up to Leadville, um, that is the southeast region that I'm going to be talking about. Here. So these are the big uh, rivers that are really, really popular in this area as far as hotspots. Uh, like I said, I, just, I mentioned the Arkansas River. It is an amazing river, really, really long stretch of gold metal water and a lot of public access along that stretch. Um, there's a river called the Arkansas, or a uh, state park called the Arkansas River Headwaters. And it's section after section along that uh, river that is all public land. It's a state park and you can go and use it uh, at your leisure. Um, the Dream Stream, I put that in there. That's technically a a nickname for a section of the South Platte River, uh, which is what this photo is actually of. Uh, it's between 11 Mile Reservoir and Spinney Mountain Reservoir. And it's a little stream, like you see there, it's you know maybe 20, 20 feet wide at its widest. It's a little meandering stream. It, it fishes a lot like a spring fed stream because it's just one lake flowing into another one. But the big trout from those reservoirs go into this uh, little section to feed and spawn. And you can catch some huge fish on the dream stream, uh, to hence the name. The thing is you will be crowded. Uh, it is not a secret. Everybody knows about it. And you might have to do some combat fishing if you're into that. I am not. Uh, I tend to find places where I can be alone, but the dream stream is a beautiful section. Uh, you'll just have to deal with a lot of other people there. 
Uh, and of course, the South Platte River is probably the biggest, uh, best well-known uh, gold medal water in this area. Uh, Purgatory Creek, if you live further south, like around Trinidad, you know of Purgatory Creek, or sorry, Purgatory River. Uh, beautiful little uh, trout stream in the very southern uh, part of Colorado, if you live down in that area. And as far as uh, lakes go, uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned Spinney Mountain Reservoir in 11 Mile. They're connected by the Dream Stream. Uh, got some state parks here, Lathrop State Park, Trinidad State Park, and Pueblo State Park. Those bodies of water are more warm water fisheries, but we stock them with catchable rainbow trout every year, thousands and thousands of catchable rainbow trout. So there's plenty of trout in those lakes, um, but you're probably, it's they're managed more for like walleye than they are for trout, but there's plenty of trout in there to catch. Uh, if you live near Colorado Springs, you might wanna just head up into the mountains a little ways and you'll find Rampart Reservoir as well as Catamount Reservoir, both full of really nice trout. Uh, the other one on here, Antero Reservoir, uh, it's in South Park, uh, which is the same place where Spinney Mountain and 11 Mile are. And Antero is well known for very, very big trout. Uh, if you get into ice fishing for trout, Antero Reservoir is a great place to go. Uh, you catch really, really big trout out of Antero. Uh, I'm surprised it's actually not a gold medal water, uh, but it's a great place to go uh, ice fishing because it is a deep reservoir and the trout, when it gets hot, tend to go deep and it's hard to catch them without a boat. Uh, if you wanna catch them from shore, you have to go right when the lake opens up and they're gonna be cruising the shallows for maybe the first month or so once that lake opens up and then maybe a month or so right before it gets too cold and it starts to ice out. That's when you're gonna be able to catch them from shore. Uh, during the summer, they're going to start go heading a lot deeper and they're going to be much harder to catch from shore. It's best if you have a boat for that reservoir. All right, moving to the southwest. Um, so everything Gunnison area, uh, Durango, uh, into the, the valley down there with Alamosa, um, Cortez. Any, if you live in any of those places, that's what I'm talking about now, southwest. So some of the rivers, we got some gold medal water. We have gold medal waters in every single uh, corner of the state, which is great. Doesn't matter where you live, you're gonna find gold medal water. Uh, Rio Grande, it's, it's just cool to say that you fish for trout in the Rio Grande. Cause when we think of the Rio Grande, we think of Texas, uh, we think of really hot <laughs> river, but it actually starts in Colorado and it starts with some beautiful trout fishing waters. Uh, and the Rio Grande cutthroat is a native fish to that river. It's really fun to catch a Rio Grande cutthroat on the Rio Grande. Uh, the Gunnison River is a great river to fish. Uh, it's a gold medal water, of course. It's The access can be a little tricky because it, Gunnison River flows through uh, Black, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, which is a national park. And it, if you thought the Grand Canyon was <laughs> deep, uh, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison is just sheer vertical cliffs, uh, deep enough that you can put the Empire State Building in it and they just go straight down. So it's not really accessible to climb down. There's about two or three spots where there's fixed ropes where you can scramble down these cliffs to get down there and fish from the shore. Most of the fishing in there is done uh, on a float tube or uh, with a guide to go through those waters. Uh, a lot of people pay for it. A lot of people can get in there, um, but it, as maybe a starting person, it might be hard to get uh, good access to the Gunnison River. Uh, once it flows out of that canyon, it's a little bit more accessible, but the fishing isn't quite as good as it is in the canyon. Um, the Animas River, another wonderful river, flows right through uh, Durango, Colorado, if anybody's in that section of the state. Wonderful river to fish. Um, my little unsung gem here is the Taylor River. It's a tributary of the Gunnison River, and it's kind of off the beaten path. It's kind of north and east of Gunnison. If anybody lives in Gunnison, you just drive north out of Gunnison and the road follows the Taylor River up to Taylor Reservoir. And that river is great. I'm surprised it's not a gold medal water. It's off the beaten path. You're not gonna face as much competition for a spot to fish and lots of big, beautiful trout in the Taylor River. Uh, Uncompadre River is another beautiful river as well. And uh, I actually, the first time I ever fly fished in Colorado, I, I learned on the San Miguel River, which flows out of Telluride, Colorado. And it, it's a fun little river, but uh, not big trout in the San Miguel, but the scenery is to die for. Uh, if you've never been to Telluride, Colorado, just drive through it once. Uh, amazing, amazing mountains in that area. 
uh, it's the Young Compadre wilderness, um, lots of high mountain lakes as well to fish in that area. And some of the lakes and reservoirs, uh, got a whole bunch of state parks up there, Ridgeway, Peonia, Mecos, and Navajo State Park. We stock all of those with uh, catchable trout. So there's always trout to catch in those bodies of water. Uh, I mentioned the Taylor Reservoir, uh, where the Taylor River flows out of. Uh, Taylor Reservoir, full of big trout as well. And the one I should probably mention for sure is Blue Mesa Reservoir. Uh, Blue Mesa is the second biggest body of water in Colorado as far as lakes go. Um, and it is full of trout. Uh, that's all there, it's trout and perch are about the only thing in there. Uh, and lots of lake trout. If you wanna troll, if you have a boat and you wanna troll for big lake trout, uh, Blue Mesa Reservoir is a great place to go. You can also catch those fish from the shore. Uh, there's plenty of rainbow trout, plenty of uh, brown trout in there. And they probably average, the average fish is at least 14 inches. Um, and there's some big, big fish in there. So if you're looking for a trophy uh, and you have maybe access to a boat, that definitely helps on that uh, body of water. Uh, Blue Mesa is a great place to go. Huge body of water can be intimidating when you drive up on it and like, where do I start? Uh, but there's plenty of fishing access points all over the shore. So moving to the Northwest. Um, so it's mostly the Colorado River drainage, uh, the Yampa River, uh, a little bit of the North uh, Platte there. Um, so anything in that Northern section. Um, some of my favorite rivers are in the Northwest here. Of course, I have to mention the Colorado River. Everybody's heard of the Colorado River. It starts in Colorado, goes all the way to the Pacific Ocean, um, made the Grand Canyon. So uh, it's fun to say I fish and I caught a trout on the Colorado River. If you go to the very headwaters of Colorado, it's like a little creek. Uh, if you're fishing it down near um, like uh, uh, gypsum, something like that, it is a giant river. So uh, it, it has a mind of its own depending on where on that river you are. It fishes like a little stream right at the headwaters and it is a massive body of water the further down you get. Uh, Gore Creek I mentioned earlier, uh, that's in uh, the Bale area and that is a great chance for it to get a Grand Slam if you're into that kind of chasing that dream of the Grand Slam. Uh, the Frying Pan River is an interesting river. There's right where it starts, the gold medal section is right below a dam. And we call that the toilet bowl. It's a wonderful little nickname for that. And it's just where the water flows out. Uh, there's a lot of mysis shrimp. I don't know if you talked about mysis shrimp in your tackle demonstrations or whatever, but it's, it's a little tiny shrimp that lives in reservoirs sometimes. And they die and they get sucked out of the reservoir. And we have wonderful imitations of mysis shrimp if you're a fly fisher. Uh, they're little white shrimp looking things and those fish in that toilet bowl will only eat mysis shrimp. They're just waiting for that uh, food conveyor belt to come out and there's big giant fat fish like 20 pound trout sitting there uh, and there's really one spot to cast there so you kind of sit and wait for the guy in front of you to finish and then you can go. Uh, it's not my kind of fishing but if you really want to catch a big trout that's a place to go uh, but you will be almost shoulder to shoulder every 20 feet right below that dam, there's somebody fishing for trout there. Uh, as you get further down the frying pan, it becomes more hit and miss with public land versus private land. You gotta really watch the signs as you're driving along so you don't accidentally trespass. Um, the frying pan flows into the Roaring Fork River, uh, which is a wonderful river. The whole river is gold medal from where the frying pan comes into it to where the Roaring Fork flows into the Colorado River. The only problem is there's a lot of private land. So best way to fish it is a float tube uh, or a guide service taking you out. There are some places where you can get waiting access here and there, but make sure you check with a map, uh, Onyx, or some kind of uh, online resource to figure out where those points are so you can wait it legally. Uh, the Blue River is up in Summit County, uh, flows out of Dillon Reservoir, and then as flows eventually into the Colorado River. The Blue River is a wonderful river high mountain river, beautiful scenery, uh, right where it flows out of the Dillon Reservoir. Uh, again, mysis shrimp is gonna, what, is gonna be what catches you the big trout there. And there's ton of, tons of big trout there, but it's right in the middle of Frisco and Silverthorne, which are little mountain towns up there. And the highway goes right over it. So it's not the most scenic, quiet, peaceful place to fish, but you're gonna catch big trout if you have the right uh, mysis shrimp on your line. 
Uh, a little bit further down the Blue River, there's some more wading access. The fish just aren't quite as big as they are right up by the reservoir. And then there's a section a little bit further down uh, called, <laughs> it's called Jurassic Park because there's so many big fish in it. But it's also really hard to access because it's almost all private land. So again, float tube or a guided floating trip down is the best way to access that section of the Blue River. And the North Platte flows out uh, just north of Walden, Colorado um, into Wyoming. And that is just a little section of gold metal water up there. But that is uh, our public access, great places to park. You just have to hike a little ways down to that river, beautiful river. Uh, but my favorite actually on this list is uh, the Eagle River. Uh, Yamper River is very, very popular as well. But the Eagle River is one of the few freestone rivers we have in Colorado. I love freestone streams and the Eagle River is just a beautiful fishery. Big, big fish. It's not quite gold medal, but it is amazing. Beautiful scenery, uh, wonderful place to fish. Uh, and I definitely recommend the Eagle River uh, if you wanna go into the mountains and try a, a new place that's a uh, freestone. And lakes, of course, uh, we have the two gold medal waters, uh, Steamboat Lake and North Delaney. North Delaney is up near Walden and Steamboat Lake is by Steamboat, Colorado, uh, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Uh, Steamboat Lake is a state park, as is Pearl Lake, and Steamboat and Pearl Lake are kind of like a connected park. Uh, they're managed by the same uh, park managers. Pearl Lake is a great place to go. Uh, you can also catch grayling at Pearl Lake, which is pretty cool, and Steamboat has gold medal fish in there. The Stagecoach, uh, another great place to go. It's just south of uh, Steamboat Springs. State Forest State Park is up near Walden. That is a great place to go if you want to do that backpacking. They have a lot of nice high mountain lakes in uh, State Forest State Park. If you're into and willing to do a little bit of hiking, great place to go. Um, and then Lake Granby is a huge, huge lake. Uh, that is formed by a dam on the Colorado River uh, up near Granby, Colorado. And it's big lake, really deep. Boat is probably the best way to fish it, but there is a little section uh, there's technically two lakes. Uh, one is Lake Granby. I can't remember the name of the other one. And there's a little stretch between them uh, that it's like a lake, but it flows like a river. And it's shallow enough that you can wade out uh, probably 30, 40 feet and only be waist deep. And a lot of big fish move from one lake to another through that little section. Great place to, to wade fly fish if you can get there. Uh, you have to park and do a little bit of a hike to get into that spot. Uh, but lots of big fish moving back and forth. Really cool, beautiful scenery. It's right at the uh, western edge of Rocky Mountain National Park. So of course, beautiful, beautiful scenery. And the Northeast where most people live, uh, Denver is in this area, Fort Collins, Castle Rock. So most of the population centers are in the Northeast. And this is my stopping grounds. I fish here the most. Uh, I fished all over the state, but this is the area I probably know the best. Uh, as far as streams and rivers, we only have one uh, gold metal water and that's the South Platte River. And that section is Cheeseman Canyon. Uh, you might've heard of Cheeseman Canyon before if you live in the Denver area. It's about an hour drive to get to Cheeseman Canyon, give or take, uh, or around Deckers. You might've heard of Deckers. And this, that section of the South Platte River is really heavily hit. It is so close to Denver. It's gold metal water and people go there all the time. It is a very popular place. And so the fish see a lot of flies and lures. They are not easily fooled. They're very, very picky. Uh, the saying is that if you can catch a trout on, in Cheeseman Canyon, you can catch a trout anywhere because those trout have seen it all and they are not easily fooled. So if you're new to trout fishing, if you're new to fly fishing, uh, I would not suggest going immediately to Cheeseman Canyon. It sounds amazing, but you're gonna be frustrated because those trout are very, very picky. Um, outside of that, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is a amazing place to go. If you uh, have a, uh, a pass to the national parks, I suggest going up to Rocky Mountain National Park. There's wonderful little streams all over the place in there. Uh, the Big Thompson River originates there and lots of high mountain lakes as well in there. Uh, Clear Creek, if you've ever had a Coors Light or a Coors, that is that clear Rocky Mountain water that they love to talk about in their commercials, that is Clear Creek. Uh, it flows into Golden and that's where the brewery is. Uh, Clear Creek actually has had some issues with uh, whirling disease, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so the population there dipped pretty heavily not that long ago, but we've been working to restock 
that uh, creek and get some more fish in there. And Clear Creek runs all the way up uh, into the mountains. And the higher up you get, you're going to find a lot of uh, brook trout. If you go high up on uh, Clear Creek, uh, no, not as many people fish the upper section of Clear Creek where there's a lot of nice brook trout. So if you're into brook trout fishing, go to the top of Clear Creek uh, towards its headwaters. If you're fishing it closer to Golden, it's going to be brown trout and rainbows and it's gonna be much more pressured than it is higher up. Uh, my favorite river here is the Poudre River, which flows uh, out of Rocky Mountain National Park and then down into Fort Collins. Wonderful fishery, I love the Poudre River. Uh, I haven't been up there, we just had a massive fire, uh, the Cameron Peak Fire. Uh, if you're a Colorado native, you probably heard of that fire last year. And there might be some issues with uh, the soot and stuff being run off into the Poudre River and kind of doing some damage to that river. I don't know where it's at just yet because uh, that river, that fire was just last year. So I have to keep an eye on the pooter and see exactly how that river ends up, if it uh, survives well and the fish hold over or not. But before the fire, Poudre River was amazing. Hopefully it's still amazing after the fire. And we have lots of reservoirs, of course, because we have need of water for Denver. Um, some of these are a little bit harder to get to a gross reservoir uh it's kind of little back roads to get up to there and again it's probably easily best fished with a boat um red feather lakes are kind of uh west out of fort collins but you can drive to those uh so they're kind of like high mountain lakes that are drivable uh so there's not too many of those where you don't have to do some hiking red feather lakes are one of them uh, lake estes and estes park absolutely beautiful scenery beautiful lake. Uh, it's got a lot of trout in it. Uh, I think it also has some pike in it. So be careful every now and then you might get a pike and it might snap your line. Um, other thing I'd probably mention uh, is uh, Indian Peaks Wilderness. So Indian Peaks Wilderness is just south of Rocky Mountain National Park and it's full of high mountain, high mountain lakes and ponds. And uh, you're going to find greenback cutthroats up there, brook trout and rainbow trout, uh, and just beautiful place to fish. And it does take really long hikes. We're talking, some of the hikes are two, three miles. There are some four mile hikes, 10 mile hikes, if you're really <laughs> into the backcountry stuff. Uh, great place for overnight camping. If you're a backpacker and you wanna hike up to a mountain lake, set up camp and fish for the weekend, uh, Indian Peaks Wilderness is a great place to go. Uh, it's gonna be a little busy on the shorter hikes, but if you go far enough back, the five, six mile hikes, you're not gonna see as many people. So that's the hot spots, the places to go in the state that I would recommend. Hopefully I covered most of the state, uh, someplace that any of you might be close to and can go to. Um, so I just wanna talk briefly about some of the conservation efforts that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is engaged in. Uh, one of the biggest issues we have uh, right now is whirling disease. Now you might've heard of whirling disease. It's, it's a parasite that affects uh, trout and salmon. And basically when the, the trout are young, it causes uh, defects and deformities in their skeletal structure. It warps their tails. It can uh, warp their jaws as well. So it makes it very hard for them to eat and swim. And basically it's a death sentence for any trout that gets it. And when the trout dies, the parasite just goes back into the water and spreads to another fish. Uh, whirling disease, originated in Europe uh, and brown trout actually have a uh, immunity to it. They've been exposed to it for so long in Europe that brown trout no longer are affected by it. But it affects all of our uh, cutthroat populations, it can affect brook trout and of course rainbow trout. Uh, so we have an issue with it here. It accidentally came to Colorado, I think in the 50s uh, from a hatch, a private hatchery that did some stocking and got it into our waterways in the 50s. And now it's in, it's found in about 20 different states. I think Pennsylvania, if you would, were part of the Pennsylvania one, uh, Pennsylvania has some moorland disease issues as well. So the, some of the things we're doing, um, we test all of our hatcheries to make sure there's no whirling disease at our hatcheries and we're not releasing fish that are infected into the waterways. Uh, we do massive testing to make sure that all of our hatcheries are whirling disease free. Uh, the other thing that we're really doing is we've we found uh, hofer rainbows are a little subspecies of rainbow trout that are native to the Columbia River, and they got taken to uh, so they got taken to Europe actually to be bred for food in hatcheries in Europe, and they got bred and raised in whirling disease positive 
facilities in Europe. And over time, those Hofer rainbows actually developed an immunity to it, just like the brown trout did. So that strain of rainbow trout, those Hofers, we are now breeding them here to release into our waterways. So whenever a waterway comes down with whirling disease, we can release those Hofer rainbows into that waterway. So there's still rainbows there that are uh, immune to that whirling disease. So the population can keep uh, self-populating and pr progressing. We don't lose a waterway that way. Uh, the other issue, um, Ben's going to talk about this a little bit, uh, is our native greenback cutthroat trout. It's the state fish of Colorado, uh, but it is endangered. Uh, it's been outcompeted by rainbow trout, brown trout, and brook trout that have been introduced here. So if you remember that first, uh, one of the first slides I showed you with those waterways and where those native fish lived, the greenback has lost almost 90, I think it's 99% of their native uh, uh, original distribution. So th that species is on the brink of extinction and we're doing our best to find places where we can restock them, put them back into the environment and take out the competing fish species. So breeding programs and stocking programs are big to bring the cutthroat back, back cutthroat, <laughs> greenback cutthroat back. Uh, but uh, Trout Unlimited is doing a lot of work with that uh, and in in conjunction with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So I, I won't go too much deeper into that because Ben has a lot more to say about that. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Andre, I appreciate that. That was, uh, that was a lot of really great information and, and some good tips on, uh, on where to get out all over Colorado. Uh, so again, appreciate it. Uh, and, and, you know, talking about the greenback cutthroat, like you said, um, I kind of like to have Ben step in here and, and begin his presentation and, and talking a little bit about the greenback restoration uh, from a trout unlimited uh, standpoint, and then um, talk a little bit more about uh, to you some to you stuff. Uh, so Ben, if you can just uh, take it away, my friend. All righty. Uh, so Andre, thanks for that uh, great analysis of spots to fish. Uh, I'm, I'm a West Sider, so learned, learned a few things myself on uh, spots I can hit up. Um, but yeah, let's uh, start talking about the, the greenback and kind of what that means to Colorado. Um, as Andre said, it's the Colorado State Fish. Um, you know, it was basically thought to be extinct at one time, only had some uh, specimens that had been identified and were in museums uh, until it was uh, relocated again in the wild. And so Trout Unlimited has been doing a lot of work with CPW to try to bring back these populations. Um, you can see this is kind of a, a map showing you where the greenbacks have historically occurred in that South Platte drainage and areas that uh, we've worked with CPW to target as uh, potential restoration areas. And um, kind of what that means is uh, not only finding an appropriate place that the fish can survive, but a place that there may be ways to keep uh, some of those other trout species that Andre mentioned from just taking the, the population back over again. Um, so Dan, if you want to, next slide. Uh, we just work to kind of identify drainages where they're natural barriers in place. Um, uh, waterfalls typically is a good one uh, where some of those non-native trout can't get up to areas where uh, we're working to restore those greenback populations. Um, so in a lot of situations, these areas will be identified and uh, we'll work with CPW to actually go in and remove uh, the non-native trout from those upper reaches and then work to you know, try to get these uh, native populations of trout back in, uh, which, you know, CPW is raising in hatcheries. And then uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, uh, we actually have a whole bunch of volunteers that go out with CPW staff, uh, put these, you know, young fish in bags and hike them in to wherever they need to be hiked into uh, to be released into these uh, identified headwater streams in the wild. Uh, you can see from this little graphic here that 
over the years that we've been working on this, we've uh, gotten more than 65,000 uh, trout into these streams with more than 200 volunteers, uh, as well as Trout Unlimited national staff and CPW staff. So there's been more than 200 people involved. And uh, some of that is not just hiking these fish in, but you kind of see the structure here uh, to the left of your screen. That's actually a barrier that's been put in place where there wasn't a natural barrier. So kind of identified uh, exactly where, you know, a good headwater stream. And what we like with that is the stream that branches off into, into several separate streams. So they're not just all in one, uh, one specific stream drainage and develop these barriers to keep those non-native fish from, from potentially coming up and uh, you know eating these little guys that we're trying to get going again. Uh, part of the process is not only I identifying these areas, but figuring out multiple areas because um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with kind of endangered species issues, but one of the big problems is they're endangered because there's not many of them left. And if you only have one small population in one stream, and we do have something like a big fire uh, and a lot of rainfall the next year that adds a bunch of sediment to that stream, you know, it could wipe out that population. So it's a lot about redundancy and trying to uh, develop areas where the fish can survive, where there's not issues with interbreeding with other species or predation by other species. And so we do just a lot of work um, with CPW over the years, uh, not only to identify and, and raise these fish, but to try to find you know, new populations or expanding populations of fish that have been introduced so that we can get new DNA and new stock uh, into the fish to try to make them as healthy as possible. Uh, so we don't just have an interbred population that might develop issues uh, down the line. So all of that uh, is kind of part of uh, Trout Unlimited's vision for Colorado. Uh, which is basically just to make sure that we've got fish around, uh, not only for us, but for the next generation. And that uh, that's not just healthy fish, but, you know, a healthy environment for those fish. So Trout Unlimited is about more, more than the fish, we're about the environment the fish live in, you know, trying to provide clean water, trying to provide cold water uh, as, you know, the Temperatures change. Uh, a lot of the trout streams are getting smaller because uh, as the t river's temperature rises, the, it's pushing the fish upstream. Um, but then we also have you know, issues with a lot of cities that uh, just with the operations of, of cities tend to increase uh, water temperatures. So we're looking at water temperature, water quality, the edges of the river, uh, just anything that can support trout habitat is um, kind of where we are. So what Trout Unlimited is uh, in the state uh, is kind of expands on what, you know, Trout Unlimited is nationally across uh, many states. Uh, we have a state council uh, of which I'm a member. Um, Totally volunteer for Trout Unlimited and uh, kind of work with all our chapters in the northwest region of the state. Uh, we have a board of directors that expands on that, that council. And then we have uh, 24 chapters that on average provide 44,000 volunteer hours just for trout. And um, in addition to the volunteers, Trout in Colorado, because we have so many trout waters, uh, we have quite a bit of interest from the national level. So we have more than uh, 15 national staff, and then we're actually able to have five full-time staff of a kind of separate entity of Colorado Trout Unlimited that just focuses on uh, supporting issues here in the state. So statewide, uh, we've got 24 chapters throughout the state. Uh, you can see pretty much anywhere you are in the state, there's a Trout Unlimited chapter near you. Uh, obviously, we love to have uh, new fishers involved and, uh, you know, welcome you to any, any chapter meetings to see 
you know, to talk more about where the fish are and, and how you can access them and how you can, can help them. Uh, I'm way over there in, in number 14 on the west side of the state. I'm in Grand Junction. And, you know, we've got different issues over here than some of the front range chapters. So all the chapters are individual, uh, but are all working towards the same goal of, you know, protecting uh, trout uh, for the future. So some of the ways we do that is by following kind of TU's national approach of this protect, reconnect, restore, and sustain. So it's kind of a full landscape approach to starting with the headwaters and guaranteeing that we have that clear, clean water right from the start, uh, and then right on through to, um, you know, connecting those rivers and supporting the chapters. A little how we do that, you know, we literally protect habitat uh, by working mostly through legislative means to, to protect that habitat. Then we work with groups like uh, CPW and other volunteer organizations like BHA to actually do restoration in some of these areas to reconnect uh, this. I mean, humans definitely have an impact on the environment and just surviving. And so a lot of uh, agricultural things have kind of broken up some of these streams. So we work with private landowners and do a lot to reconnect these streams, reconnect populations. Uh, the more places fish can go, the healthier population is going to be. And through that restoration, and then also just uh, sustaining all of the people that are on the ground doing the work, uh, whether that's through trying to raise money to fund projects or actually just providing educational support. And uh, I'll get into a little more of that as we go. But specifically in Colorado, um, some of the, the big things we've done or, you know, actually work to shut down some, sorry, my dogs are going crazy. We work down some, just a second. Well, if you're like every other Colorado I know and you have dogs, so you, you understand. But uh, we're, um, you know, we work to, to try to stop projects that really uh, affect trout habitat and the future of trout in the state. And we've been really successful with that. Uh, we've been successful in, in restoring a lot of river miles uh, in working through legislation to, to get buffers in place uh, for things like oil and gas. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and, you know, just everything we can do, whether it's legislative or on the ground work. Uh, one thing that's always interesting about a group of volunteers is that everybody has a different passion. A lot of people are all about wanting to go to the state legislature and talk about stuff. And other people are about getting out in the river and moving rocks and, and planting willows. And Trout Unlimited is really great about providing opportunities for all of that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit now about kind of what some of our priorities are uh, currently. We're actually working on a, a new strategic plan now, but a lot of it centers around, I don't know if you, any of you have heard about it, but a couple of years ago, uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board, uh, working with a lot of input from the public and other agencies, developed this Colorado Water Plan and you know a lot of that is how we can maintain enough water uh, for the growing population and for agricultural needs uh, but a big part of that is uh, maintaining water for uh, the environment and for our fish and so we're working a lot uh, in a lot of areas with the colorado water conservation board in this colorado plan uh, we work a lot with advocacy i'll talk a little bit more about that but if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically uh, working with the legislator, working with politicians, advocating uh, for something. And in our case, we're advocating for the fish. And uh, if any of you guys, you know, read Dr. Seuss to your kids, the Lorax speaks for the trees, try to limit it, it speaks for the fish. And that's uh, kind of why we're here and what we're doing uh, in the state. And of course, working with native trout, as I mentioned, the greenbacks. And then uh, I'll close, close out with a, a some of the stuff we're doing with youth education. So as I mentioned, the, the Colorado Water Plan 
is a lot about these integrated stream management plans. So every basin within the state of Colorado uh, has a, a board that's working within that basin uh, to try to develop some of these stream management plans. And that's, like I said, everything from industrial and agricultural users to residential users, like where's the water going? And so uh, we, TU makes sure that we have members from all of our chapters in these different basins are called basin roundtables, and we make sure that we have people sitting at that table and uh, speaking for the fish, speaking for keeping water uh, in the stream and what we can do about it, um, and the, really just working statewide uh, with our state representatives and uh, other agencies, um, you know, to promote healthy watersheds in the state. Another part of that Colorado Water Plan is actually getting projects in place and uh, while planning is necessary we're trying to get beyond the spending a bunch of money on 10 years of planning you know we've been doing this a lot we know a lot of what works and doesn't work so actually getting money on the ground and out there doing projects and adapting if we need to uh, but there's a lot of funding behind the, the Colorado water plan and so we're trying to work with some of that funding to get our chapters doing projects on the ground uh, a lot of that's just to keep water in the river, uh, which benefits, you know, not only the fish, but uh, residential and agricultural users downstream as well. And some of that advocacy I was talking about, uh, you know, we're working to, we've got a couple of different programs, but one of those is actually water leasing, where uh, Trout Unlimited will actually pay agriculture users to let a field go fallow for a season and uh, keep, keep water in, in the river or work with them to convert from alfalfa to, to a native hay to reduce that water usage. And you know all of that is to keep water in the stream, to work with these in-stream flows. And that, a lot of that starts you know, at that legislative level and working you know, not only with legislators, but we have a lot of chapters that send in letters to the editor to, to be published in papers and to try to get public uh, consensus and support behind these so that you know they'll call the state legislators and, and talk to them about it uh, just to try to keep more water in the river. Another thing that we're pretty involved in advocacy wise uh, is mining. Uh, Colorado has a long history of mining. You know, it's what got a lot of people here. It's what brought a lot of money into the state. Uh, but a lot of those mines have just been abandoned. And so Trident Limited has quite a few staff members that work just on abandoned line, mines. Uh, the big Gold King mine spill, if you've been in Colorado for a half a decade or more, you know, that was back in 2015, actually. I can't believe it was that long ago, but uh, on the Animus River and had a huge mine spill that it bumped, dumped a bunch of heavy metals into the water. And so... You know, we're working with legislative, legislation lately. Just last year, we worked to, to pass some legislation that makes new, new mines actually responsible to do some kind of cleanup when they're done. And that, that hasn't ever really been a part of Colorado law before. And so uh, we do, we've done a lot of uh, work. Uh, we actually have a, there's a national TU position uh, that is a lobbyist at the state legislature. And they... Uh, well, she goes in and finds out everything that's going on and lets the chapters know so that we can, you know, provide support uh, for, you know, what would be best for the environment, you know, moving forward. Some of that advocacy and legislation uh, led to a lot of public lands protection. And uh, a couple of those uh, that would like to highlight uh, the Rhone Plateau. It's a big area here in the West Slope. Uh, if you're familiar with the Flat Tops, it's just west of the Flat Tops area. And there was uh, just lots of oil and gas um, proposed for the Rhone Plateau. And a few years ago, there was some legislation that came forward to actually limit any kind of buffers uh, for our rivers and streams um, down to, I can't remember, either 30 or 50 feet. Uh, but basically you could put it a gas well or an oil well, you know, within 50 feet of a stream. And um, I mean, 
it, it doesn't take a, a scientist to realize it's that could potentially affect the stream. And so we were able to work um, with all kind of outdoor groups and CPW, um, I mean, Rocky Mountain Elk and BHA and even mountain biking associations uh, all came together and talked to uh, industry folks and worked with the state legislature and actually got some really uh, solid protections in place for the Rhone Plateau, which is headwaters for a, a lot of uh, rivers and streams here on the west side. And then Browns Canyon, again, if you've been in Colorado very long, you know that that was a newly designated national monument um, right through the, the gold medal waters that Andre was talking about on uh, Arkansas River. And that was a lot of work uh, by Try Limited and a lot of other people to try to get those protections on on that gold medal water to make sure that it stays gold medal. And so, yeah, it's not quite a national park yet, but received that national monument status in, in 2018. And so uh, that's just some of the, the public land stuff that we've been involved in. Aside from that, we've got, you know, like I said, these chapters all around the state that love to get out and do work. And that could be actually moving rocks around to try to, to create better trout habitat uh, to just water sampling. Uh, we have a number of water uh, temperature data loggers that we work with to provide CPW with information here on the west side uh, to willow plantings. And it's just been crazy because it's been 50 years across more than 20 chapters. There's just an incredible amount of work that uh, Trial Unlimited has been able to do to help the native uh, fish populations here in Colorado. And of course, we can't help native fish populations in the future if we don't get the youth involved. And so that's a, a big part of what we do. Um, it's, you know, it's a big part of what our local chapter here in Grand Junction does. Uh, we're, we're kind of a desert town, so we're you know, a good 45 minute an hour from any trout. So our local trout are in our classrooms. And uh, we work with kids in these trout in the classroom projects so that uh, at this middle school age, they're raising trout, they're learning a lot about conservation, and they've got these trout in their, in their classroom for an entire year and have subject matter focused around not only the trout, but what healthy streams are and what, uh, where their drinking water comes from and all these things. And so it's great to work with teachers around the state in these kind of classroom settings to, to get kids starting early to think about uh, like I said, where their water comes from and, and why the fish are healthy or not. And we've got other programs like Stream Girls and um, Adopt a Stream and Adopt a Trout uh, that we work with to, again, try to get kids involved. Uh, the Stream Girls is, you know, elementary, middle school, up to high school. We've got uh, Adopt a Trout is actually where kids have the opportunity. It's typically high school level to actually go and tag trout and monitor where they're going in the stream throughout the year and provide that information to CPW. And uh, yeah, just really get the kids involved, not only in learning, but in the actual doing uh, of the conservation for trout in the state. And then finally, uh, we're able to provide an opportunity for depending, depending on the year, anywhere from 12 to 20 kids to go spend a week at a conservation and fly fishing camp every year. Uh, they learn everything about what bugs are under the rocks. So, you know, what flies and lures are gonna work to water quality and what that means to how to catch a fish. And uh, just anything that we can teach them about fish and fly fishing and, you know, how to protect that resource in the future and it's just great every year. Uh, the chapters are involved with this by actually funding the kids that do this. Uh, it's not a super cheap camp, so most of the chapters actually fundraise throughout the year to be able to support kids to uh, come in from, you know, the inner city in Denver or Pueblo or uh, just anywhere we can find kids that are interested that, you know, may not otherwise have an opportunity to do something like this and, and to get out and learn about trout. And so Trout Unlimited is really trying to work in the state of Colorado, you know, from the youth all the way up uh, to, you know, seniors. Uh, we have a lot of veterans programs um, and we just do everything we can 
to try to get more people involved in fishing, uh, more people involved in conserving the resource. Uh, once, once you're hooked in fishing, then you're going to want those fish to be around. So it's just kind of a logical next step to protect that fishery. And, uh, you know, what can, what can you do? Uh, one of the places you can do it is with, you know, Trout Unlimited. Uh, if you're interested, BHA is another great resource. But there's really good, good places out there to go to learn not only more about great spots to fish, but about how you can make sure they're going to be great spots to fish in the future. I think it's all I got for now. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to stop the, the uh, actual sharing of the presentation here. And, uh, and, and we're going to kind of allow everyone to kind of just see, see our happy little faces here. And we'll have some, I'd like to have some conversation with all, with the two of you um and ask a few kind of some questions to, to give the audience a little bit more some in-depth knowledge hopefully and then we'll uh, folks if you have any questions we're happy to take questions uh from the audience and please drop them into the into the chat here um and we'll we'll try to get them answered uh so kind of touching then on what you were just saying um and i think this is a question for both of you you know you you were saying once once folks kind of get get out and get angling get hooked um you know what we might have some of those new anglers here I, we might have some uh veteran anglers as well but for the newer anglers um you know what would you that are that are coming into colorado trout fishing specifically what are you what would you like to share with them like what do they have to kind of look forward to or, or and things like that I mean, I just want to say that uh, trout fishing can be for everybody. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from, what you look like. Uh, trout are a great fish to catch. They're a lot of fun. And the thing with trout fishing, it can get a little snobby if you're new to it, uh, especially fly fishermen or fly, fly anglers. Um, just be, people, especially fly, fly anglers, we love to use bigger terms and like all the special names for all the flies. And it can be very overwhelming and daunting if you're brand new to it and it can feel like you'll never figure it all out. But don't worry about that. The fish don't know the names of the flies either. All you have to do is look at a bug and find a fly that looks similar. That's all there is to it. And we like to make it sound a lot more complicated than that. And we use big words and all these clever terms, but don't be, don't be put off by that. Uh, you can figure it out really, really easily. The fish don't know what everything's called. Just look, watch their behavior, figure out what they're going for, find something in your box that looks similar. Um, that's that's one of the things that I, I fell into when I first started. I was like, I need to know the name of everything. I need to know the, how to tie every single type of knot. Don't get overwhelmed by it. It, it can be, you can catch trout very, very easily. Uh, just with power bait, you can do it. <laughs> so don't let it, overwhelm you anybody can do it yeah and i'd say kind of playing off that i think uh well i hope what uh you know anglers would look forward to in colorado is uh you know just enjoying it and enjoying figuring it out and figuring out the the fish and uh i mean that's you know my favorite part is you know i am tricking a fish into eating something that is totally unnatural but is something that that fish wants and uh kind of playing off what andre said like yeah i i don't know all my flies i literally when i talk to the local fly shop you know he'll say oh you should fish this and this and i was yeah which one is that like i i don't know um but i was up on a stream in Wyoming one day, just cause somebody told me it was a cool place to fish. So I drove up there, just went out, was all by myself. There's nobody else there. There's a hatch coming off and I was trying all the stuff that made sense to me to try and fish just weren't interested at all. And then uh, I caught one of the bugs on my shoulder and I looked at it and it just had a section of it that was bright orange. I mean, like a cone on the interstate orange and i looked in my box and i had 
one fly that was almost that exact color orange. It didn't really look like it otherwise. It just had that orange on it. So I put that fly on, and my next cast caught a fish. And I caught three more fish, and then that fly broke off. So I looked at my box. I didn't have anything else that was exactly like that, but I had something that was a little kind of orangey. And I put that on, and they didn't like it as much, uh, but I caught a couple of more fish. And that was just one of those, like, I'd been fly fishing for years at that point, but that was just one of those eye-opening things to me. Like, like Andre said, like, the fish don't care what the fly is. If it is even close to what they're feeding on, then they're going to take it. Um, but if you're slapping the water for hours and not having any luck, then you're just not even close. Like that's the frustrating thing to me about trout is how picky they can be. And they'll, they'll be on something one day and you go back the next week and they just don't care about it at all. Um, but to me, I mean, that's what, that's what is a lot of fun is figuring it out. And, and when you do figure it out, you just have an epic day and, you know, talk to other people and they're like, yeah, I caught one or two. And it's like, that's cause you didn't figure it out, but I did. Right, right. Awesome advice. So tying into this conversation about new anglers, and as we all know, um, the past year, we because of COVID-19, we've had a flood of new anglers come into just about everywhere. Um, and, and actually not even just anglers, people just wanting to get outside um, and, and, and experience new things and have a newfound appreciation for the outdoors. So fishing often uh, uh, gets folded into that. Um, but can we talk a little bit about, um, just some of the things around, around some fishing ethics for the folks and access and particularly kind of how it pertains to, to Colorado. I know we talked a little bit about knowing rules, like with the, the, um, the boundaries of, of where you can go as far as in the water on, on private property. Is there some other stuff that, that you want to touch on just to let the folks know that that might be new, that that's kind of just good food for thought stuff for them? Sure. Yeah. I mean, best, best advice I can be is just respect the resource. Um, it is the, the trout water and the trout are for all of us uh, to enjoy and go out there and catch and be it if, if you're catching them to eat them or you're catching them to just catch them and release them. Uh, it's for all of us. And if we all treat that resource uh, with the respect that it deserves, it'll be there for the next generation and so on down the line. So uh Things to like, don't pull it, don't, you know, cut off a bunch of line and just leave it in the river. That's going to kill something or, pull, you know, just be mindful of things like that. Don't, don't bring stuff with you and just leave it on the riverbank. Don't pollute that waterway. Uh, be careful where you're walking, especially when trout are spawning. Uh, don't step in reds or the, the beds of where those uh, eggs are and destroy the next generation. Um, those are things you'll pick up as you go, being able to identify where those are so that you can avoid them if you're waiting in the river. Um, and, you know, treat, if you are catching and releasing, you know, quick release, uh, don't, don't stress that fish out so that it dies two days later from what, from you handling it. Always wet your hands before you handle the trout uh, to protect them, things like that. Just the, the more effort you can put into being a good steward while you're out there, uh, the better the resource is going to be for everybody. Uh, we, we we like to practice leave no trace uh, practices. Uh, we preach that at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Basically, wherever you go, leave footprints, take only pictures. Um, and so basically, don't take anything out that doesn't belong to you. Only thing you should be leaving is your, the footprints that you use while you walked in. Ben, anything from your end that you want to add? Well, I think, I think Andre pretty much covered it. I mean, that's the, you know, if there's a, if there's a sign somewhere that says, you know, you shouldn't go into the, you know, don't sis, fish this section, it's under restoration or, you know, don't take a motor vehicle there, you know, recognize that the four wheelers, a motor vehicle too. I mean, you know, just like you said, respect the resource and, uh, you know, pay attention. Um, and yeah, leave, leave no trace is, as I always like to say, Bigfoot's been doing it for years. So just copy Bigfoot, leave no trace. Right. Um, we talked a bunch about kind of on the ground things that uh, 
Trout Unlimited and CPW do, but um, can one of you talk a little bit about how CPW and CTU work together? It's kind of not necessarily on the ground stuff, some more of that, like, um, um, I think we mentioned, um, I don't know if we mentioned it yet, um, but the, I think it's called the Wildlife Advisory Board um, and, and things of that nature, kind of the more meeting and discussion and, and decision-making type of, of, of um, partnerships. Yeah, um, so yeah, what, what you're talking about, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has a commission. Uh, it's a 11 member commission and all decisions, that, that commission basically makes decisions on wildlife management laws and regulations for hunting and fishing. And uh, that process is a public forum. It's open to public input. Uh, they, the commission meets, I want to say, at least six, six to eight times a year. And before COVID, they would travel around the state, do a meeting in Denver, do a meeting in Pueblo, Grand Junction, Durango, so that it doesn't matter where you live, you could go to one of those meetings. Now they're doing them digitally, so it's even easier uh, to get to those meetings. And you can file a petition if you want to speak if you have a topic that uh, you want to bring up uh, and you can speak directly to that commission and voice your opinion and your uh, fears or concerns. And all of those decisions by the commission are also backed up by science, scientific data. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has tons of biologists that go out into the, to the field. They do animal counts, uh, fish counts, they sample water and make sure that the water's clean and pure. And the decisions that they present to that commission are based on the, that scientific research to try to do the best job we can at preserving uh, the resources that we have. And through that commission, we also work a lot with partners like Trout Unlimited. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has dozens of uh, affiliated organizations, be it uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or the Mule Deer Foundation for the Hunters, uh, Trout Unlimited. Uh, we have a lot of uh, education partnerships as well where uh, they go into the communities and teach kids about the outdoors, hunting, fishing, uh, backpacking, bird identification. And we just love to work with organizations because Colorado Parks and Wildlife can only do so much. Um, we only have so many volunteers, so many staff members. And at a certain point, we need uh, wonderful partner organizations like Trout Unlimited uh, to pick up the little the weight that we can't lift and work with us on projects. And uh, Ben can talk about a, a lot of those projects that he's actually doing with Trout Unlimited. Yeah, so we, we um, you know, some of that advocacy, advocacy stuff I was talking about earlier, you know, we work pretty closely with CPW to, uh, to make sure that, you know, what they've seen is gonna be the best uh, process forward for the fishery is actually you know, reflected in what's coming out of our state legislature. Uh, and then uh, we also work, as you mentioned, with the education stuff. I've done a lot of stuff here uh, in Grand Junction where we work in conjunction with CPW to do uh, Fishing 101 or Fly Fishing 101 and uh, take a day to, to go in and, you know, teach how to fly fish or teach about trout conservation and uh, really partner at that local level with CPW aside from kind of the higher level stuff. Uh, but as, some of the, as far as some of the higher level stuff goes, uh, Trout Unlimited in Colorado is, is working on a new strategic plan right now. And um, a good portion of that planning is how do we get uh, not only more, but a more diverse uh, group involved in Trout Unlimited and fishing, fly fishing, and so, uh, you know, I've been actually working directly with some CPW state staff uh, and other folks like BHA and, and Brown Folks Fishing and trying to figure out, you know, what can we do? What activities can we hold? Um, what gear can we get and provide? And, you know, really working as a, as a group of partners with a similar goal, which is get more people out, get more people out fishing uh, to figure those things out. And so, you know, at that level, you know, it's huge for us to have CPW involved because obviously they know way more about, you know, use and how to get people to state parks and everything else uh, than we do. And so it's been a really good partnership uh, to figure out, you know, the best approach to get the most people involved. And so we're, like I said, we're involved 
definitely on the local level. I feel like pretty much all our chapters work with work with local CPW staff and everything uh, to that more more state level as well. And you know, I would say 20 years ago that wasn't the case. Um, but now, you know, over the last decade, we we developed a really solid relationship with with CPW, and I've I have no problem for whatever if it's a a regional or local thing, uh, you know, just calling up my local CPW fisheries person and and talking, you know, through an issue with them, and it's um yeah, it's just really it's cool to see state organizations and and nonprofits, you know, working together um, to accomplish you know good stuff. Love it. Um, so I want to move into a little bit more of, um, some user questions, attendee questions. So, uh, we have a couple that are here. Um, first off, just some questions about like, uh, as far as the gold medal waters are concerned, are we, uh, Andre, you touched up on a bunch of them. Um, but a little bit more specifically, like, is that, do the regulations differ in gold medal waters? Um, you know, is there, is there a cost to them? Is it, is there anything specific that goes into them or, or how do they differ really than, than regular waters? Yeah. Um, so gold metal waters are like any other water, uh, as far as price, like one fishing license for the state gets you every body of water in the state, as long as it's on public land. Um, so there's no additional cost to fish gold metal water. Uh, it's just a, a categorization to sh say that this is a body of water with lots of big fish in it. Um, the, the other aspect is to try to keep those waters as gold metal waters where there's lots of big fish that anybody can go and catch. Uh, there's usually some more, uh, regulations that go into those areas and they're a little bit more restrictive. Uh, sometimes it's strictly catch and release only where you can't take any of those fish. Uh, usually there's going to be, uh, so sometimes there might be barbless hook requirements in those areas uh, for less stress on the fish. It might also be uh, artificial lures and flies only in certain stretches. Um, and the other thing you might see is uh, if, if it is a place where you can take a fish, those limits are usually lower than the state limit. Uh, whereas the state limit's usually like four fish, four rainbow trout a, a day. Uh, in certain gold metal waters, it might be one fish a day or two fish a day. Uh, but I, I mentioned that we have those uh, fishing brochures. You can pick them up at any CPW location, anywhere that sells a license. So Cabela's, Ace Hardware, Walmart, they all have those brochures there. And I did mention early on, like it's, it's about a 40 page brochure. The first five to 10 pages are just basic laws and regs. The last 30 some pages is very specific. This body of water has these regulations on this stretch. Um, so if you're going to some of those gold water waters, always check that fishing brochure because the gold metal waters are gonna have a few more odds and ends, little uh, nuances to the regulations on those bodies of water. Just, and those, those laws are just there so that we can maintain that gold metal status. Are, uh, is that information available online as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can actually put that right here in the uh, chat box. So, um, hang on, I gotta go to everybody. So that is the link to our online brochure. Um, and if anybody here uh, speaks uh, Spanish as their first language, uh, we also have it in Spanish. Uh, so second link is the Spanish brochure. The first link is in English. Um, and like I said, you can also pick up a hard copy anywhere licenses are sold in any CPW location, any state park, uh, but it's also all online as well. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll have um, a resource page for you all to look out for. Um, and I'll mention that um, when we wrap everything up, that'll be coming to you very shortly too. Um, you both talked a little bit about tailwaters as opposed to freestone rivers and things like that. Can you explain for the audience and first those uh, that are that are brand new to angling and are, you know, are, are kind of in this series with us just learning about trout fishing for the first time and have, have learned about some, you know, the last week they learned about moving water versus still waters and things like that. Can you explain just more specifically what a tailwater, what, what, what is a tailwater versus what is a freestone river? Yeah. Uh, it it's yeah, just just terms. Uh, it, it's not a big 
thing. Uh, a freestone river just starts at its source, usually up in the, the mountains in Colorado. Most of our rivers are fed from snow melt uh, or other places it would be like a spring fed uh, starting point. And it just flows naturally uh, to wherever it's going, to its destination. There's no dams on it. There's no man-made barriers on that river or stream. It's free flowing or a free stone. Uh, when we start putting dams on rivers and we build reservoirs and things like that, the water below that reservoir is what we call a tailwater flowing out of that dam. Um, so it, the tailwaters can be a little bit more tricky to fish. They, they don't have the same kind of hatches that freestone streams have, um, different bugs and things at different water temperatures. But the great thing about freestones is they don't freeze, or sorry, uh, tailwaters, they don't freeze in Colorado because the water is actually coming out from deep in the reservoir where the water's warmer. So when it comes out uh, of the dam, that water is warmer and doesn't freeze. So even in the winter in Colorado, you can find waters to fly fish or spin cast uh, for trout because that, that water will not freeze until it's maybe three or four miles down from that dam. So there's always some place to fish even in the middle of the winter. So that's a, a plus of the dams, but uh, the fish don't get to move as freely as they can on a freestone. So I want to circle back to something that you kind of just mentioned and 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 the three of us had actually talked about offline uh, before. Uh, you're both pretty accomplished anglers. Can, can you explain for some of those new folks, uh, particularly that are getting into fly fishing, and you can expand into conventional gear if, if you want to, um, a little bit about the kind of hatches and differences in hatches. I mean, specifically related to the different regions and things like that, because as I shared with you, I'm in Pennsylvania and, and it's there's specific places where things change, but overall a, a, a hatch chart for Pennsylvania is gonna give you a pretty, pretty good sense of what's going on, but there's definitely some differences in Colorado. Can you share a little bit of those tips for everyone? Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna take all these. If you wanna jump in, Ben, feel free. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, every body of water is gonna be a little bit different, uh, the kinds of, animal the kind of aquatic insects so so trout for the most part until they get really big they're not predatory fish they're not eating other fish until they get pretty big when they're smaller they eat uh, aquatic insects for the most part so mayflies uh caddis and uh midges things like that and tailwaters you're going to have a lot of midges uh, which are those little itty bitty tiny bugs they kind of look like mosquitoes but super little tiny things um so if you're new to fly fishing uh uh, basically, when I talk about hatches and stuff, that's for fly fly anglers. Uh, spin casting is different stuff that you're going to be using, uh, but for fly fishing, little tiny itty bitty bugs on tailwaters. Uh, it's a pain, little size twenty hooks, size twenty two, horrible things to tie on if you, if your eyes are bad. Um, but then, uh, I mean, blue wing olives, you can't you can never go wrong. There's always blue wing olives everywhere. Um, Caddis flies, I see them everywhere in Colorado tons of caddis flies. Early in the, in the seasons, you're going to find those stone flies, those big, huge flies. Um, and that's just like a chunk of steak floating down the river for a trout. Like when the stone fly hatch is going off, like those trout are just gorging themselves. Uh, so those are great hatches to catch. Uh, the thing that a lot of people might not think about if you're new to fishing in Colorado is the elevation changes. Um, so the temperatures are going to be different depending on your elevation. So the fish is, uh, the way the fish act is going to be different depending on where you are as far as altitude goes. So they're going to start spawning uh, sooner, uh, further down where it's warmer. So the spawn kind of goes up uh, in elevation as the water temperature changes and the fish get into that uh, process of wanting to spawn. Same thing with hatches. Uh, hatches are key keyed by temperature of the water. Uh, so it's colder, higher up, warmer, further down. So again, hatches are going to move the same way, kind of up in altitude. Uh, so if you miss a hatch one day, go up the stream, maybe a few miles, you might catch it the next day. Um, this is one of those things that's unique to Colorado with the altitude variant variations and things. Um, one other thing that I might point out as far as fishing in Colorado to, to kind of look out for is actually right about this time of year is ice out. Um, so all of our high mountain lakes, 
they start to lose their ice covering uh, in June, uh, really high, about 10,000 feet or so. About June is when those lakes start to ice out. Um, right now, you're going to get like the 8,000 foot lakes are probably all iced out right now. And when that ice goes away, the fish are ready to feed. Like they've been stuck in really cold water all winter long. They're hungry. They're ready to feed. So if you hit a lake right at ice out, right when that point when the ice goes away and the fish the water temperature reaches the right level so that those fish get active and get started and feed, you can have an amazing day, 50 fish in a day, 100 fish in a day uh, on those ice out water. So that's another thing to, to pay attention to this time of year in May and June. Uh, and you'll just kind of have to gauge what the elevation of the lake you're going to is at and look at other lakes at the, as you drive up to see like where they are on their ice out. because. Hitting a, a high mountain lake at ice out is an amazing experience. You could just catch fish all day long and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and kind of playing off of that, um, you know, I've typically ice out fish with a little, uh, well, a big fly called a, a woolly booger, um, but I've actually had good luck um, with conventional tackle and a big, big heavy bobber with a woolly booger a couple of feet away from that bobber. And you can launch that thing out when the ice has gotten farther away than you can reach with a, with a fly fishing rod even. So ice out, like you can fish with flies with conventional gear. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great opportunity. Um, another thing I, I think a lot of um, incoming fishermen probably don't realize is that, you know, these hatches uh, when they come off, that's the last stage of that particular bug's life cycle. And their life cycle in the water is much longer than their life cycle in the air. And, um, you know, some of these bugs may be in the water for a couple of years uh, before they ever hatch and fly away. And so, you know, whether you're fly fishing or fishing conventional gear, you know, a lot of these rivers that have the stone flies in them, like you're talking these big fish, you know, you can use a stone fly lure or stone fly uh, fly. You know, it's a big, looks kind of like a centipede with legs kind of looking thing. Um, any time of year, because they're in those rivers for I think 18 months typically before before they actually hatch out. Um, and the same is true in a lot of our still waters. Uh, we have damsel flies, which if you've ever seen a dragonfly. If you see a dragonfly that's a little smaller and bright blue, that's a damselfly. And they're on pretty much every still water in Colorado and every still section of a river in Colorado. And those nymphs are in the water for two years before they hatch and fly away. And so it's just a little green, green and orange guy about this big with some beady eyes. Um, will work in any still water anytime, any time of the year. Uh, so they're, yeah, I think it, it's funny because fly fishermen a lot of times get focused on this particular nymph or this particular dry fly. And there's a lot of times a disconnect into this nymph becomes this dry fly. And really, how long is that nymph that you can catch, you know, going to work? Um, a lot of people are all about dry fly fishing. Um, my girlfriend's one of them. She would, she does not like the nymph at all, and would much rather dry fly fish all day long. Um, but 90% of rainbow trout and 70% of drown, brown trout do all their feeding underwater. Um, so the, the dry fly thing, yeah, it's a lot of fun to see them crush the surface. Um, but you're going to catch a lot more fish if you're a nympher. And I'm not really a nymph guy. I don't really like it much either. I'd, I'd rather, rather dry fly or. or uh, you know, throw streamers. Um, and, you know, just, just so you know, if you get, you know, we can have some pretty rough wet weather in Colorado sometimes and uh, winds can get crazy. And I prefer to fly fish, but I've almost always got a conventional rod with a Rapala next to me. And if the wind is too crazy, I just catch brown trout all day on a Rapala. It's all good. That's good tips. Those are really good tips. Um, 
I think I have time for one more question uh, that I wanted to field from the audience because I think it's a it's a good one that we didn't really touch anything on, um, but is I think is important. And I know the answer for Pennsylvania, but I don't know it for Colorado. Um, someone was asking, you know, what what resources do you use uh, for checking out water levels on the different places that you want to fish? Uh, you know, when we, it's it's a safety concern, and oftentimes, and like you said, the weather can get crazy. Um, so what what are, what are the resources that that the two of you use? Uh, I mean, the CPW puts out a fishing report uh, weekly, actually, and you can sign up for it on uh, CPW's website. Uh, I'll actually here, I'll just put this in the chat. So um, that is the link to sign up for CPW's fishing report, and that'll be emailed to you once every Friday uh, all year long. And it'll tell you uh, where things were stocked most recently. Uh, it'll tell you sometimes where the best fishing might be. Uh, sometimes it, it'll have links to those uh, flow reports as well. And a lot of times if I'm going to a specific river, I'll just Google search, uh, what's the flow on the Arkansas today? What's the flow on the Big Thompson? And uh, it'll take you straight to that uh, a geological survey data and tell you like if it's flowing high, because um, some of my rivers that I fish are an hour and a half drive for me. And I don't want to drive up there and see that it's just completely blown out and unfishable and, you know, flowing at 500 CSI and, or a thousand or whatever. And I can't even wait in it. So that's too much of a drive for me to waste a day driving up there to find out that I can't fish it. So um, Google search really quick and simple. Uh, if you know the body of water that you're going to go to that, uh, that yeah ben just shared it there so great place to go to find those water levels and um also if you just want to keep in touch with where we're stocking fish uh where if it's going to be in your area or stuff that fishing report is a great way to see the the waters that were stocked that week uh if you want to go out and catch those uh <laughs> really dumb fish right out of the hatchery that don't know what's going on yeah like andre said i just uh, threw in the the chat the usgs uh, stream gauge site um, and that you know it doesn't really tell you much if you don't know you know what the average level of your stream is supposed to be uh, but you can look at some kind of historical averages and know but you know quite honestly I would say pretty much every town near any kind of fishing in Colorado has a good fly shop and you know whether you're a fly fisherman or, or a conventional tackle fisherman just go in and talk to them and they'll uh they'll tell you what's best what's working um one thing it took me a while to figure out about fly shops is most of the guys in fly shops are just passionate about fly fishing they're not passionate salesmen like they're not not going to push to make a sale they would much rather tell you where you can go and catch fish and what you can catch it on then try to sell you, you know, the best new pair of waders it's in or something. Um, so don't feel intimidated at all about going into fly shops and just asking them like, what's hitting where? Um, and they'll, you know, my, my local fly shop here, I, I always go in before I'm going to go somewhere and I'll set great plans to go. You know, I got Friday off. I'm going to go to this river and I'll go talk to him about what's the best thing in the river. And they'll be like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. The flows are, you know, they just mess with the dam. They drop the, they've been raising the flows uh, at night for power and dropping them and the fish are all freaked out. Um, so even if I'm looking at a stream gauge and the flows look good, you know, I might not necessarily look and see what it's been doing for the last week. And, and the fly shops always know that. And they'll, you know, they'll warn you off of crazy, you know, power management flows that just freak the fish out. And then, um, and they'll, you know, by the, the same token, they'll, they'll they'll just say, I'd wait a week before I go there because, you know, they actually care enough that they contact, you know, whoever's doing the power management to see when that river is going to be fishable again. And so, you know, that's a big resource to me is just the local fly shops. And like I said, don't feel intimidated like you have to buy something. Um, I typically, if they say this fly is working, one thing that you should probably realize about trout is kind of from my story earlier on is once you find what they're on, that may be the only thing they're on. And so I would always have at least three of whatever you're taking with you. 
whether it's a lure or a fly, uh, because if you lose that one, you could be frustrated the rest of the day. So that's, you know, typically if a fly shop says this fly's working, even if I know I already have a couple, I'm gonna buy, buy a couple more anyway. Um, Cause I mean, it's, it's three bucks and that could make your day. So why not? <laughs> Yeah, good tip. One Go last ahead, resource. Oh, yeah. One last resource that I share, um, put in the chat right now. This is CPW's or Colorado Parks and Wildlife's fishing atlas. And this actually has marked every body of water in the state that has fish in it. And you can pull up a map of the entire state. You can see where there's family friendly fishing, where there might be uh, peers, uh, if you might have a disability, limited mobility, things like that, where there's fishing peers to help you with that. Um, and you can also search by species. If you've never caught a grayling in your life. Like I really want to catch a grayling or I really want to catch a golden trout. You can actually use this atlas, find the bodies of water that those fish are in. Uh, find the one that's closest to you and plan your trip up there to catch that grayling, catch that golden trout. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. I use it all the time if I'm going to a new body of water, just to kind of figure out what's going to be in that body of water uh, and the best access points. And it'll, it'll also bring up a list of like anywhere nearby where you can buy a license, uh, all that information, CPW offices, and it's a great, great tool. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. Those were a ton of really great tips, uh, a ton of really great information uh, about trout in Colorado specifically. Um, so uh, before we wrap up, I just want to remind everyone, look out for the uh, follow-up emails coming next week. Um, we're going to have replay links for all the presentations, uh, including this one, uh, as well as that link for the, the resource page uh, that we've developed for this series, which will have uh, a bunch of the links that Ben and Andre have dropped into the chat here today. Um, they'll be on there. Uh, so definitely keep your eye out for that. Um, and don't forget uh, the fish for free days uh, in Colorado, June 5th and 6th. Like I said, it's a, it's a great way if you're, if you're still a little bit unsure and you, you haven't bought that fishing license yet and you want to get out and, and give it a try without having to, to, to drop the money for that right away. If you don't know if you're going to like it, give it a try that uh, those, one of those two days, it's a great opportunity. Um, and that said, I just want to thank both of you, uh, Ben and Andre for being our presenters today. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, thank you if you've joined all three days. Thank you if you've, if you've enjoyed uh, just for one day. Um, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll 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 be coming back to you with some with some other great uh, trout fishing resources and things like that from TU, BHA, and and CPW. So thank you all a lot. Have a great weekend. Thank you.